This is the room where I have the pollen donors for the crosses that I want to make this winter. These pots are a breeding selection that has really big fruit and is very resistant to powdery mildew, which is a disease that affects the leaves and if it gets really bad, it can ruin the fruit. I'm here at the Genetic Improvement of Fruits and Vegetables Lab in Beltsville, Maryland. This is where research geneticist Dr. Kim Lewers and her colleagues are creating new varieties of strawberries. Inside their greenhouse are dozens of plants of strawberries, grouped according to a crossing plan she designed to create new seedlings with all the characteristics that make them appealing to both growers and consumers. Think taste, size, color, storage length, growing season, firmness, and disease and pest resistance. I'm always so excited to come in this room and see these plants. They're so lush and beautiful. And I imagine to myself that one of these may be the next big cultivar. This lab has long produced strawberry cultivars with natural disease resistance that don't need to be sprayed with fungicides, including keepsake, a promising new cultivar with outstanding flavor and shelf life. Then there's Early Glow, long considered the gold standard for flavor, and Flavorfest, which is quickly gaining market share for its high yield of large, flavorful berries. One nursery told Dr. Lewers that they sold over 17 million Flavorfest plants just this past year. That's such a thrill that we are able to help so many growers. And also such a thrill to realize it all came from just one little baby like this. Stepping inside a walk-in freezer, I was shocked to see the strawberry plants sitting in this cold actually flowering. Each plant is a new breeding selection that needs a chilling period to reset their clock before a vigorous spring growth period. That's when they'll produce runners for further testing. Okay, it's too cold for me. Let's step back outside. I asked Dr. Lewis about their newest strawberry release, called Cordial. It's a late season cultivar, which the uh, growers have been asking me for, and it has very large fruit, which the growers always want because the customers like to see big fruit. It is naturally resistant to the key fruit rots that are worldwide in importance. All strawberries need sun to make sugar and taste sweet, but rainy days mean strawberries have less sugar and can be very tart. But with cordial, even after rainy days, it still tastes good due to its low acidity. It doesn't taste too tart. It's not going to bite you. It's friendly. It's cordial. That's how it got named. Today we're going to pull the curtain back and see how new cultivars are created. We start in the greenhouse, where Dr. Lewers grows many unique strawberry seedlings, each with its own distinct characteristics. Every plant produces what is commonly called a runner, which looks like a long green stem coming from the base of the plant. The runner carries all the characteristics of its mother plant. Only about 50 of these seedlings will actually be selected in the field for further testing and given a selection number. Dr. Lewers tests her new selections by propagating many copies of each selection from the runners and then tests them for ideal characteristics and any flaws. Sound easy? Well, it's not. It takes years of testing to decide which seedlings have what it takes to be a cultivar with all the traits that growers, markets, and consumers are looking for. There's a ton of science, knowledge, and yes, lots of math that go into breeding these plants. The genetic makeup of each cultivar has to be examined, and because we're dealing with nature, the plants don't always produce as expected, especially when it comes to the repeat fruiting trait. We decided independently and together to use more advanced genetics tools like uh, molecular markers and genetic mapping to try to better understand the inheritance of the repeat fruiting trait. As an example, Dr. Lewers and her colleagues couldn't figure out why certain strawberry plants did not fruit repeatedly as anticipated. I noticed that if the molecular fingerprint said that it should be a once fruiting type, it was. Always. No question. 
always. But if the molecular fingerprint said it should be repeat fruiting, it was only half the time. And that made me think, huh, half the time, one to one, there's another gene involved. I studied these segregation ratios until I realized that there was one gene that was shutting off the gene we had all mapped. It was like if you drive down Main Street and you're trying to get from point A to point B and there's three traffic lights. One says green, but the next one says red. You're not going anywhere. That's the way these particular genes worked. And it's not very common. We all know it exists in plants, but it's rare to find an example. It was very frustrating. It took a lot of work, many years, often working way past supper time, but it was worth it. The revelation that comes after discovering something for the first time is truly a unique experience for the scientific field. This is something that I want to share with any young person who's listening and who is considering a career in science. There is nothing that I know of that can replace the thrill that you get as a scientist working on analyzing your data or being out in the field and you either suddenly see something or you suddenly discover something in your data and you know that in that moment you are the only person in the entire world who knows that fact, who's in on that secret. It's just a wonderful feeling. I don't know any other job where you can get that except in science and I love it. Thanks for listening to this superfruit edition of Science in Your Shopping Cart. Stay tuned for future podcasts, and in case you missed it, check out our other podcasts on our website or on our YouTube channel. For Science in Your Shopping Cart, I'm Todd Silver. Science in Your Shopping Cart is produced by the Office of Communications, Agricultural Research Service, an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. For more information, visit www.ars.usda.gov. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Like us on Facebook and watch us on YouTube.